Thank you, Bob. If your Bibles, would you turn to Acts chapter 13? We're going to be looking at Paul's first missionary journey. I so much appreciate our videographers. I also appreciate John Parker getting this together for us. If you look uh, to the right of your screen, you'll see that big yellow dot, Antioch. That's where we're going to begin today, Antioch of Syria. If you have been following um, the news recently uh, in current day uh, Israel, that's south of where we are here, south of our map. You'll see Cyprus on the television news networks, and so you see that. And uh, so we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 13 and what is Paul's first journey on mission to carry the gospel to various areas. You know, as you're turning there, uh, some of my most precious memories have been serving on short-term mission uh, with some of you. In fact, even as I was watching that video, John Parker and I, uh, Brad Russell spoke on the first uh, video. And John Parker and I had the privilege of doing foreign mission work with him and got to know him. You know, you really get to know people when you travel with the short-term mission team. For instance, uh, John Parker, I know that he has a hymn on his mind all day long. He wakes up singing or whistling uh, Christian music and and hits the hay the same way. I, I learned that Mike Johnson actually gets up before a lot of people even go to bed uh, because uh, uh, he's up well before uh, daylight. But you know, I've had the blessing of doing short-term missions on four different continents, North America, South America, Africa, and Asia. And other than a few mishaps, like uh, almost falling into a manhole in uh, South Africa when I came off of a wall, um, being in Africa and realizing that after eating a pack of nabs, if you're not from Central Virginia, nabs or toast cheek crackers, um, Realizing that I was lying on the floor in a third world country that a rat had been licking the cheese off of my finger while I was sleeping. I don't bite my fingernails on mission trips, I'll just tell you that. <laughs> Having the privilege of carrying on a ministry in a place called literally Hellville, which all types of superstition and the like. Um, in spite of all of those things, these trips have been special uh, to me. Quite a few of you in this assembly have at some time or other in your life been involved in a short-term mission trip, and it really makes the world seem to be much smaller. Um, th there's a bond internationally, brothers and sisters. In fact, uh, I need to share this with John. I just received an email from a pastor that hosted us in a foreign country, a young pastor that checks up, and there's just a bond that will actually never come to an end as we go to heaven together. But you know, as you think about short-term mission trips, there's a lot that goes into it personally and as a group. You have to secure uh, visas. You have to be sure your passport is up to date. In certain areas, you have to make sure that your immunizations are kept up. There's a cultural training and awareness that goes along with it. There's supplies to be collected. There are group meetings that have to come about. And all of that culminates in, for us, in, in our context, often about two weeks of mission work. And what you pray is that you have the health to do what you need to do because you just have a short amount of time to get something done and, and there's an urgency to the task and everybody is alert and attuned to what's going on because not only do you realize that as every hour goes, there's one less hour that you'll be in this place. But you also understand that you may never have the privilege of returning to that place again. So today we're going to begin uh, what is going to be a two-month study, uh, almost two months, uh, October and November, on Paul's first missionary journey. We're going to look at the sending church. We're going to look at um, sort of his itinerary 
that he had for the mission. We're going to look at the responses that came, the various places he went. And we're going to begin today in Acts chapter 13, if you'll look with me in verse 1. It says, Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus, arriving in Salamis. They proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. They also had John as their assistant. When they had traveled the whole island as far as Paphos, they came across a sorcerer, a Jewish false prophet named Barjesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, that's the meaning of his name, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, stared straight at Elymas and said, You're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery, you son of the devil and enemy of all that is right. Won't you ever stop perverting the straight paths of the Lord? Now look, the Lord's hand is against you. You are going to be blind and will not see the sun for a time. Immediately a mist and darkness fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then when he saw what had happened, the proconsul believed because he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we open uh, your word today, open our eyes to the truth. Uh, Lord, may we be a kingdom-minded church. Father, may we be committed as a people to carry the gospel beyond these walls, not just sending out our monies, but also people. And Father, we thank you for what we have to learn from your word, not just through the direct teaching portions of scripture, but the narratives. Speak your truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, the context really for uh, our setting here in Acts chapter 13 is this, you know, Paul is preparing for the first of what would be three missionary journeys. And as is in the case in any endeavor, there has to be a starting point. And so there's a starting point here for Paul's ministry to go to other places. You know, here at Concord, uh, we have our starting points. Whenever we have had teams who've gone out, and maybe you've been a part of these teams, usually we'll meet in uh, the Fellowship Hall area. We'll collect the supplies. We'll have people. There'll be well-wishers and those who will send us off with prayers, and we'll move on into the mission God has called us to carry out. Uh, other trips I've been a part of, uh, we've had individuals who've met through, uh, from various parts of the United States, maybe at a central airport, we'll have a debriefing and then we'll move right into the work that uh, is set for us to do. And so today as we look in Acts chapter 13, I want to look at some truths here about the beginning of Paul's missionary journey. And the first thing I want you to note with me is Paul's point of origin. It's the church at Antioch in Syria. Now, you know, we're a Concord Baptist Church, but do you realize there's also a Concord Baptist Church in Charlotte County? And so whenever I speak of Concord Baptist Church in the Farmville area, I say we're Concord Baptist Church Farmville or Buckingham because I need to make a distinction from the other Concord Baptist Church in the general area. Well, we're going to see in the study in these next couple of weeks that there's another uh, church uh, in, in its Antioch in Pisidia. But this is specifically Antioch in Syria. And this is a strategic church. In fact, the church at Antioch in Syria was a sending church. In fact, you can read about it, and I would encourage you to do so. The latter verses of Acts chapter 11, we see how Paul uh, was sent there, was 
brought there, and for a year he and Barnabas spent time teaching there, and this was an eclectic church. It was a church made up of a number of different individuals. The gospel, uh, after Stephen's martyrdom, people left out of the area of Jerusalem. They began to carry the gospel, and so there were Jews who were carrying the gospel to Jews, but there were also Gentiles who were coming to a faith, and these individuals collectively, corporately worshipped in Antioch of Syria. In fact, Acts chapter 11 says that people were first called Christians in Antioch, but that wasn't the only first. But Antioch is actually the first sending church in all of Christendom. In other words, uh, yeah, there was the persecution that happened at Pentecost. There were those who were dispersed, who carried the gospel, sort of in a hodgepodge way, you might say. But here we see a church corporately coming together and actually sending out missionaries into other parts of the world. The church at Antioch is certainly a model church. There are just some things I want to bring out about the church. First, it was a diverse congregation. Isn't it great? Isn't it great to be able to have a diverse congregation of various nationalities, of various backgrounds, of various ages? This church was very diverse. In fact, there are five individuals that are mentioned, and they cover all over uh, the map. We see uh, the first is Barnabas. Barnabas Barnabas was from Cyprus. You see Cyprus to uh, the south and the west of that big yellow dot representing Antioch in, in Syria. He was from uh, that island. We know that Simeon was likely from Africa, far to the south. Such was the case with Lucius, because Cyrene is actually would be like in present-day Libya, Libya, which would be in North Africa. Menean, it says that he was a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, which would put him south of this area, close into the area in and around Galilee in the Holy Land. And then Paul was from Tarsus in Cilicia, which you can see to the north, a little bit to the north and to the west of that area. Simply put, this was a diverse congregation, a picture really, a microcosm of heaven. But not only was it a diverse congregation, it was a gifted congregation because we see that each of these individuals that were mentioned, they were prophets and they were teachers. They were able to speak the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord. They were able to teach. They were given gifts of proclamation. But those weren't the only gifts because it says that the church was ministering. They were worshiping. They were ministering. They were carrying out the work, and God was preparing to send two others out into the work. It was a learned church. It was a church we see that was uh, the recipient of great teaching. And so it was a church that was doctrinally sound. Paul had spent, as we said back in Acts chapter 11, a little over a year in this area teaching the truths of the gospel to individuals. But the fourth thing, and this is very important, it was a sending church. It had a kingdom mindset. Now, don't get me wrong. It is great to be a diverse church. It's great to be a gifted congregation. It's, it's great to be a learned congregation, a congregation that's sound doctrinally, but that's not enough. It's important that the church go beyond the walls. The church needs to be a sending church if it's going to be a model. And that's exactly what the church at Antioch was. We see in verse 2, uh, after the, the leadership that is mentioned there, the prophets and the teachers, that they were worshiping the Lord. They were fasting. And they were recipient of the message of the Holy Spirit who said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. In other words, God is saying, I'm calling two of the five out. 40%, he says, I want not to stay here. This isn't just a campground setting. This isn't just a campfire setting. This isn't just about you guys growing, but it's time to extend. And we see that Antioch had a great thing going, but when God called them to send them out, they didn't figure, how are we going to get by with only three-fifths of our prophets and our teachers? No, they said yes, and they sent out, and they laid hands. Now, the laying on of the hands doesn't confer anything. It is really just a symbol of the fact that they said, yes, God has called these two men, and we're sending them out with their blessing. 
the sign of a healthy church is a mission-minded church. Now, there, there are important things, uh, paying the preacher, paying the light bill, taking care of our ministries in here. Don't get me wrong. I understand all of those things are important, but it is so important that the monies, that the energies go even beyond the ministry here. And, and, and I applaud the church in that uh, not just 10%, but somewhere around 13 and 14% of the monies that come in here, more than a tithe, go out beyond the walls of this church. But I want you to see not only the sending church, but once Paul and Barnabas were sent, I want you to see their plan for ministry. And it was this, to preach the gospel to the Jews first. Now, Israel is really at the center of the news today. I want you to see that when the mission work was being carried forth, God made it very clear through the Holy Spirit that the gospel was to go first to the Jews. You may remember during Jesus' public ministry, there was a Syrophoenician woman and she asked Jesus to heal her daughter. This was in Mark chapter 7 and also described in Matthew chapter 15. And Jesus gave her a surprise response. This was not a Jewish woman. This was a Syrophoenician, a non-Jewish woman who said, Lord, would you heal my child? And Jesus said, why would I take what is for the children and give to the dogs? Now, somebody who has just a superficial elementary thought of this would say Jesus was insulting the woman. He wasn't. What was he speaking? He was speaking about order. Now, unless your dog crazy, I'm not one. Some are. I wouldn't feed the dog from the table. The dog gets what? Seconds. So what is Jesus saying here? The gospel in orders to go to the children first, and from the children then it goes on to the Gentiles. He wasn't berating the woman. He was speaking of order. And so when we read Romans chapter 1, 16, we see that order to the, to the children, to the Jews first, and then to the Gentiles. You may say, well, well I don't understand this. I, I don't understand why it has to go to the Jew first. Well, I don't know either. But there are a whole lot of things I don't know, and that doesn't make them wrong, okay? And, and so that's just God's plan. And so, you know, if you've ever been on a mission trip, you understand what I'm saying, a short-term mission trip. In fact, I received a notice from NLGM, uh, the, the organization that we helped last Christmas. Uh, they are in Bolivia now, and they said, oh, there's been an adjustment to our schedule. We had a flight in country in Bolivia from one place to another. We were not able to get there, and they said, we're having to adjust on the fly. And that happens. I can remember we went to Brazil a number of years ago. We had plans to go down the Amazon. The uh, generator went on the ship and we stayed there. But whenever that happens, what do you do? You don't sit there and say, well, We'll just wait. No, remember, you only have a short amount of time, so you begin to adjust. You begin to do ministry where you are, and it so turns out with them recently and with us in the past that it is actually what appeared to be an obstacle becomes a blessing because God puts you right where you are. But still, when you go on a trip, you have an itinerary. And unless something changes it, there's a plan. And Paul had a plan here. And the plan was this, to go into the synagogues first. And so we see here that he was sent out along with Barnabas. Uh, to, they went down to Seleucia and they sailed to Cyprus and they arrived in Salamis. Salamis is sort of east there in Cyprus. You can see it. It's that dot as you go across the uh, Mediterranean there, and you see sort of to the northeast of, of Cyprus. They were in Cyprus, and notice what it said. The very first thing they did, they proclaimed the Word of God. Where? In the Jewish synagogues. That was God's plan. But that isn't the only time. That was the norm. Because in, in chapter 14 and chapter 13, verse 14, they continued at that point. We'll look next week to Perga reach Pisidian Antioch. And on the Sabbath day, where did they go? They went into the synagogue and they sat down and began to teach. In chapter 14 and verse 1, we'll read how they went to Iconium. And when they went to Iconium, what did they do? That same itinerary. They went into the synagogues 
and they preached. Now understand this, it wasn't that the gospel was just for the Jews, but God's order was to go to the Jew first. Even if I were to leave out of this building today, in order to get to the front yard, I must first go through the front foyer. It's not that I go to the front foyer and I stop there. It wasn't that the gospel went to the Jews and stopped there. No, it was the gospel went to and through the Jews to the nations. God loves all people. That's why we pray pray for the Palestinians who are caught in the crossfire, who didn't begin all of this conflict. We pray for them too, even as we would pray for ourselves. And so the plan was that the gospel would go to the Jews. I wonder today, do you have a plan for sharing the gospel? Do you have a burden? Do you have, you say, okay, the, the, these are my essentials. It might be a neighbor. It might be a coworker. Do you have a, a plan in order to reach them? But I want you to see, thirdly, the response to Paul's ministry. And you would think, okay, all of this effort went in. Everything was going to go smoothly. Everybody was going to hear and receive. But what we see with Paul was a mixed bag in terms of human response. We see that in verses 6 through 12. So we see that after he had been in Salamis, it, Salamis, he goes down. It's hard to see, but right at the bottom there of Cyprus, he went to Paphos. And while he was at Paphos, we see that he met at least two men. We know that he met more than that, but these two men were important enough for Luke to include in the account. Now, we read earlier in the New Testament that Jesus sent the disciples out, even as the church sent Paul and Barnabas out. And, and the disciples, they came back to Jesus. And at the end of chapter 14, the end of our study, we're going to see that Paul and Barnabas come back to Antioch in Syria and give a report. But the disciples in Jesus' day, when they came back, they said, boy, some great things happened. And guess what, Jesus? We saw this man who was casting out demons in your name, and we told him to stop. And they were waiting for Jesus' approval. But what did Jesus say to them? The one who is not against us is for us. He surprised them. He, he said, whoever is not against us is for us. But conversely, whoever is not with Jesus is against Jesus. You're either for him or against him. Today, either you align your life with the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus is your Lord, or not. And so as we look here in, in Acts, we see this response, this twofold response. Here, we're going to look in just a moment at Sergius Paulus. What did he do? He sided with Jesus. He believed. But we're also going to see this enemy, Alimus, who tried to thwart the work of Paul and Saul. Next week, we're going to look at Pisidia and Antioch. The masses wanted to hear, but there were some Jewish leaders who insulted Paul. We move on to Iconium. We'll do that. Jews and Greeks believed, but there were unbelievers who poisoned the minds of those who received. In Lystra, there were people who so identified with Paul that they were ready to worship Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas corrected them in their ignorance but in the same way, there were people who stoned Paul. So in this account, we see the beginning of this pattern. We've already seen a pattern or an itinerary, but we see a pattern of response. There's some who believe and some who don't. And today there's some who believe and some who don't. Let's look at the good. First, today we see Sergius Paulus. It tells us in verse 7 that he was an intelligent man. He was the proconsul. A proconsul was a senator who actually was placed in authority over an area by Caesar. He was placed such because Caesar himself didn't have to have a handpicked representative because in these areas, usually there was little military conflict or threat of people trying to overthrow power. And so while there was not a military coup uh, that was set apart, that doesn't mean that there was not spiritual conflict because here Paul takes the gospel in there. And in this man, it said he wanted to hear the word of God, the end of verse 7. Sergius was serious. He was serious about the gospel. And then in verse 12, we see that he was amazed. And this jumped out at me. 
at the teaching of the Lord. Now, what we see is Paul performed a supernatural act in making Elimus blind, and Sergius Paulus saw it, but he was not amazed at that. He was amazed at the teaching. Why is that? Because the gospel is the power of God under salvation to all who would believe, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. This man was astonished at the gospel. And when we take the gospel out in the power of the Lord, people's lives will be changed. But I want you to see the bad because there was a man named Bar-Jesus there and Luke makes it very clear this is a misnomer because Bar-Jesus means son of salvation and this man was anything but a savior. Luke calls him Elimus. You're full of all kinds of deceit. You're the son of the devil, an enemy of all that is right. Well, why did Elimus reject Paul's message, the gospel? This is important. Because the gospel infringed on his life and his plans. The gospel presents us as we are. Elimus was making money off of his relationship with Sergius Paulus. Elimus had Sergius Paulus's ear, but now the gospel had it. And Elimus didn't like it because the gospel made him uncomfortable. You know, the reason people reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's not because they don't intellectually understand. It's because in their hearts, they resist the truth that God has a right to our lives. He's Lord. He is Lord of all. And so the gospel will be preached and there'll be people like Sergius Paulus who want to hear, who will adjust, who will be amazed at the teaching and say, I believe. And then there'll be others in that same setting who will say, I don't want to follow Jesus. They'll say, I don't want to adjust my life. I've got a good life here. I'm making money. I'm doing my own thing. I want to run my own show. But the gospel confronts us. Do you realize that Elimus was living a lie? His very name was a lie. He was living for the approval of a man, Sergius, who was actually, before he came to know Christ, loving the show that Elimus was putting on. But more than anything, he was living for himself. And there are many people today who will reject the gospel because they're living their lives for themselves. Listen, walking an aisle doesn't make somebody a Christian. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and repenting, that's what happens. Notice what he says. Elimus was opposing them. And in verse 9, Saul also called Paul stared straight at Elimus and said, you are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery, you son of the devil and an enemy of all that is right. And then what does he say? Won't you ever stop perverting the straight paths of the, of the Lord? What is he saying? Repent. Stop what you're doing. Stop it and go in another direction. God may be telling you today, Stop and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been studying a book uh, Erwin Lutzer wrote on Wednesdays in the past few weeks. And he wrote a simple statement. Repentance is always the first requirement of deliverance. In our text, Sergius repented. He went from following uh, this magic and this witchcraft of Elimus to being amazed and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've never done so, I hope that you would do so today. Because you see, the gospel is confrontational. And we're going to see throughout this entire study, wherever the gospel goes, it's not just something that's a pansy gospel, that it confronts the truth that man is a sinner, that Jesus came to die for sins, that Jesus was raised, and you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you believe him today? Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, Lord, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. But Lord, it is a power that confronts us. 
even as Paul confronted Elimus. It is a gospel that tells us that we are sinners, that we're not all that. It's a gospel that tells us the wages of that sin is death and separation from God, but it's also a gospel that says that if we would repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll have eternal life. Father, there may be some within the sound of my voice today, they're not practicing sorcery like Elimus, but if the truth were known, they do share this in common with him. They're not willing to give up control of their lives to follow you. Lord Jesus convinced them that you died for them and you rose again and you can give them the power to live a victorious life above the frustrations that are beneath the service with them. Father, we thank you for Paul and Barnabas and others like them that are willing to go for churches that are willing to send. Father, make us like they are and they were. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know how God has spoken to you today, but I do know this, Jesus is Lord. No matter what is happening in the world today, Jesus is Lord. I wonder, have you aligned with him? As I said, we're going to see throughout.